Hey Marco, how are you? I'm very good. How are you, Alessandro? Maybe you can introduce yourself. My name is Marco Witzman. I'm one of the co-founders of Valley Space. I used to work as a spacecraft engineer for avionics systems and change management at OGP System. And in 2016, I founded my own company, which is called Valley Space. And today we're around 20 people who empower engineers all around the world to build better products. Tell us a bit more about your vision for model-based systems engineering and how it influenced uh, the development of Valley Space. Yeah. So I believe, I mean, let's start with the problem statement, right? Like why would people actually care to put anything into a model? And I think the main problem that people faced is in the 1960s when there was the Apollo mission, a new way of engineering was needed. Okay, so people were actually building the Saturn V rocket with hundreds of thousands of people and they didn't have a good method for people to collaborate. And the one thing that they came up with was document-based engineering. So what you saw in these times is basically that people were starting to write down parts of the design onto documents, which would be an analysis of a certain part of the flow of a valve for the rocket or similar. And then they would like issue that kind of document. So they would basically uh, make copies of that document and give it into folders on the tables of several of the people who might be interested in that information. And to make sure that people were like on the same page, uh, they would have versionings on this. So they started to put like these version numbers on these documents. And that's how collaborative engineering in the first place was a bit formalized. And now we're speaking about models, right? Yeah, so now the question is like, you start with documents and then you, you move a few years forward and you find out that documents have a problem, right? Documents are not really interconnected between each other. What one document says, the other document might actually be contradicting it and so on. So people found out there, it would be great if we would have something singular to work on at the same time. And they call this then a model where basically every discipline just sees a certain view of that specific model. And so everyone would be working at the same time on the same model. And you would basically take away that document-based approach and you would go to a model-based approach. And this idea came and then the term was created, MBSE, Model-Based Systems Engineering. And with it, the idea of how to model things and people were starting to figure out which languages do we actually use to make the description for this and so on. And after some time, people came up with what is SysML, so uh, as a modeling language. And SysML today for many people is the same as MBSE. People treat it almost as similar, but they're not, right? We believe that like actually MBSE is like a philosophy and SysML is one flavor, one language in how you can do these models. Yeah, there's really two types of models, right? There are descriptive models and computational models. What's, what's your view? Is there one that is better than the other? So I think people thought that with descriptive model they could solve everything. And then they found out that if values actually depend on each other, if you actually have values that change and that have to propagate, these descriptive models are just not sufficient. And that's basically one of the main reasons, I believe, why SysML has also not found its way into all the industries and is not used widely by every person because it stopped at the descriptive level. And that's basically where what we call data-driven systems engineering comes in. So data-driven systems engineering, DDSE, is basically a subpart of model-based systems engineering, right? It takes the idea that you should have a model, but it puts the emphasis on that there's actually data that is interconnected and therefore you start having models. These can be simulations, they can be calculations, but they can also be descriptive like documents or things, but they all rely on the same data. So at the heart of DDSE, the idea is you have shared data model with interdependencies that really represent physics, right? So you change something on one side, the other things change with it. In MBSE, the idea is you should have as a description that is as perfect as possible of the, dis of the system. So the original SysML MBSE way of thinking. So how is DDSE different from um, concurrent design? So I think concurrent design is something that you can do with DDSE. DDSE is basically a methodology across the life cycle. It just means that you have a connected model and data is changed and interconnected through it. Concurrent design 
at least in my opinion, is something that happens when people are collocated in the same room, right? It's usually for early stage right. of a project. And at that time, you have everyone talking about the concepts and trying to implement those concepts at the same time. What we see is that in these concurrent design facilities, what you need is you need a DDSE tool, right? You need something that connects that data to each other so that the change to one model changes in the other place. And this is why all the concurrent design tools are actually somehow calculation based. They are somehow based on formulas and things like this. The DDSE thought goes a bit further. It believes that you can use DDSE methods and tools in the early phase for concurrent engineering, but you can also use it once people are not sitting anymore in the same room. So you can actually keep working on that same model without a breaking point and go all the way and keep improving that model, detailing it more, connecting it to more things. Right, so basically um, what you're saying is that DDSC is what uh, people in the concurrent design community have been talking for some time, that is to extend this type of way of work into later phases of the life cycle, am I right? Yes and no, because the idea, like the idea, yes, like everyone has been talking about the idea of extending it. The problem is when you think of it from the starting point and just think of extending it, you're using the same concepts and trying to like adapt them on the way. And I think that might not be sufficient of an approach, right? Because in early phases, first iterations and first simplified models are good enough. Let's think about CAT systems, okay? So if you, for example, want to make some shapes, it's probably enough to know there's a sphere here, there's a cube there, and so on, that's enough. But then if you want to extend that, you're like, at some point, you're getting more and more detailed, but then there must be a cut to the actual CAD software, right? There's at some point, you really have to model it in real CAD to do FEM analysis and all of this. So if you're just thinking about how can I take my early part and extend it, then you might hit walls that are impossible to overcome. And that's why I think the right way to think about it is to say, okay, let's look at what the whole process should look like. And then a sub part of this starts to be concurrent engineering and what we need there. Of course, learning from everything that has been done over the last decades, right? I mean, it's not about throwing it away. It's just about like thinking the whole process through rather than trying to take the phase A part and extending it. My next question is, um, how does it relate to product lifecycle management, PLM? Sure, that's a good question. And I think it comes back to the same thing. There's people who have been thinking it from a specific point and trying to extend. So in the PLM or PDM, product data management, product lifecycle management, um, what you have is it's people who come from the CAD world where everything is 3D parts and so on. And that's their definition of a model. And now they're extending it by putting some metadata on it, right? And you can also, this also can have a power consumption. This also can have a data rate. But the reality is that's not what the entire life cycle really looks like, right? In reality, you know from every spacecraft project, um, maybe a fourth or a fifth of the people in the team will actually work with CAT models. The other people are actually working on data handling, on AOCS algorithms, on uh, trajectory planning, on other things that have no relationship to CATs whatsoever. So you cannot say the CAT is the central model and I just have some extra data. You actually need a data layer which describes all kinds of parts of a mission of a product and so on and can also have interactions between them. So if I change the power consumption of my onboard computer, it needs to have an impact of how long my battery lasts and it cannot just be a property of the onboard computer itself. And that's what the PLM and PDM systems don't provide. They, they promise it, it always sounds like, oh, we're doing everything along the life cycle. But all companies that actually implement it find that it's great to keep track of physical parts, of um, bills of material, things like this, but it's not good at modeling all these other things. We at Valley Space, we thought about very hard at the very beginning. When we started in 2016, we thought very hard, like which should be the basis of these models, right? Lots of people had thought of a lot of complex models. So you have always the problem. There are some models which are domain specific. So these kind of models, um, they come already with a language and with things that you would expect from a certain part. There is the other approach that says, okay, let's have something very, very generic, right? Like SysML2 or things like this that say we can model everything. It's very, very complex. You need to learn this whole language. There's experts in it who have like decades of experience, but we believe 
that one huge aspect of being able to work in a data-driven way is that everyone can participate. Every expert needs to be able to participate. What we've seen is in the past, the mistake was made that people relied on people learning SysML, on learning um, these specific languages. And then if not everybody was speaking them, then your models were worthless to those people. So what we said is, okay, let's take those both approaches aside and take a third approach. And the third approach is coming up with a model that is as simple as possible so that people don't even notice that they're doing data-driven engineering. They're not even noticing that they're working on a model. So we said, any product that you're building probably has a product breakdown structure, right? It's some product which has some subsystem, some units, some whatever. You can break it down infinitely because any product can be as complex as you want. And these parts, we call them components, they have properties. And properties are data. It can be single values, matrices, all of these kind of things, right? It can be data sets and so on. And we said that's enough of a model. And this is something that everyone can understand. I can explain in two minutes and I can show everyone in two minutes and people because the model is so simplistic, can then add all kinds of things on top of it. And of course, if you go in detail, it becomes a bit more complex. You might have some mode management here and you might have some specific kinds of formulas there and so on. But on the first entry point, everyone can work with it the same way that if I send you an Excel sheet, you immediately can understand in general what numbers are there and so on, how the formulas have been written without having to have gone through a course about all the Excel formulas that are out there and all the ways how models work. All right, uh, Marco, let's go and look into Valley Space, shall we?